Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Palm Springs Drive Church of Christ. If you'll open your Bible to Psalm chapter 22, that's where we're going to begin this morning as we talk about the times when God says no in our lives. If you're visiting with us, we're so happy that you've come and you're an encouragement to us. We hope that you'll stick around and give us a chance to get to know you better after services. This is a, a famous psalm, the one that Jesus quotes from the cross when he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I just want to hone in on the next verse, the one right after that, to capture the feeling there. David says in verse 2, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Uh, prayer is a paradox. On the one hand, it is one of the most beautiful, powerful, comforting blessings in the world to have a direct line of communication with the creator of the universe. But on the other hand, prayer can be tremendously frustrating and confusing and sometimes devastating emotionally when the creator doesn't seem like he is listening. When, like David here in this psalm, we cry out to God, but it seems that there is no answer, or even worse, that the answer is no. We've all, I think, at one point in our lives felt the brutal reality of being told no by God. Even recently, when faithful brethren from all over the world were praying that God would heal fair Roberts, and she was not healed. Maybe for you it's a prayer that your chronic pain will go away, or that you'd land a certain job, or that you'd find a spouse, or that your unbelieving family members will change, or that your spouse would change, or a million other things, and it just feels like all God is doing is saying no to my requests. And when that happens, Satan tempts us to think maybe God just doesn't care about us, or maybe prayer is just totally useless. How can we think differently about the times when God says no? Because this is such a common question, and probably because I've been preaching to myself for the last few years because of the headaches, um, I've actually preached two other sermons on this subject over the last couple years. One was in 2020. It was called, If Only You Had Been Here. And the other was in 2021 called, When God Doesn't Answer Our Prayers. And if you can imagine a spectrum where on one side of the spectrum you have a, a very emotionally comforting, heartwarming kind of sermon on this end, that's the sermon from 2020, which is, if only you had been here. Then on the other end of the spectrum is a more intellectual, academic sort of lesson. Well, the sermon from 2021 is kind of right in the middle of that spectrum between the two. And then this morning's lesson is over here on the intellectual, academic side of things. This lesson is more thought-forming than heartwarming. But if you are wrestling with this subject, I'm just letting you know about those other lessons because it might be helpful to go back and listen to those other lessons because... This, this subject can be approached from many different angles, and sometimes we need that. We just, certain angles resonate more with us. So this morning is just another angle on this. And since Dwayne had seven points in his sermon last week, I had to top him with ten. So number one, number one, we are not alone. You know, the Bible is not embarrassed about this subject at all. You would think that God, he would not want people to know this little detail about the paradox of prayer because if people found out that, hey, sometimes God says no, well, maybe they wouldn't want to serve him. But God gives us plenty of accounts in scripture of him telling people no, and he's not embarrassed by that. He's not ashamed by that at all. For instance, Abraham asked that Ishmael would be the chosen seed, and God said no. Moses pleaded to enter into the promised land. God said no. Job demanded answers from God about why he let his family die. God said no. David begged God to spare the life of his child after his sin with Bathsheba, but God said no, and the child died. Mary and Martha asked God to send Jesus to keep their brother dying, and God said or keep their brother from dying, and God said no. Now, obviously, we know how that story ended, and Lazarus was resurrected, but originally, they didn't want him to die at all in, in the first place. Jesus himself, God's own son, was on his knees with his face to the ground, begging God, please, don't, 
don't make me have to go through with this cross. And God said, no. Paul the apostle begged God to remove whatever this thorn in the flesh is. There's a lot of debate about what that, what that is. God said, no. This is the painful reality of the paradox of prayer in this sin-cursed world. And if we have never, or, excuse me, if we have ever been told no by God, we are in very good company. Secondly, God doesn't owe us yeses. Now, there's an interesting way that the psalmists speak, and I'll just give you one example, but it's all over the psalms. David says in Psalm 4.1, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. David considers God's yes to his prayers, really even God's hearing, even God's willingness to hear his prayer as an act of grace, which means it's, it's undeserved favor. Think about our position before God for just a moment, that, that we have sinned against Him terribly. And, and really what we're all deserving of, the Scripture says, is death. And what that means is we are therefore responsible for the death of Jesus on the cross who died on the cross to take our place. And so we're really not in a great position to demand that God say yes to our requests. Uh, one preacher illustrated this way. If you go to a restaurant and the waiter, you know, you place your order and the waiter says, nope. Not bringing that for you. Not going to bring your food. We would have a right to be furious because we're paying for that service. But we're not paying God like he's a cosmic waiter whose role is to simply take our order and get us what we want. He is the creator of the universe and he is the one who paid for us to be in relationship with him, with the blood of his son. Job demanded that God give him answers about why his family died and why he was going through all these things. And God asked this to Job in response, who has given to me that I should repay him? He's telling Job, I don't owe you an explanation because I don't owe anyone anything. It's not that God, and I understand, and this is why it's good to approach this from different angles, right? Because you might read that and that's ah, really cold of, God, of God's part. It's not that he's being cold here. He's just trying to teach Job wisdom about the fact that he is the creator. He manages his world perfectly and he doesn't have to answer to us for how he runs the universe. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it's part of, it's part of wisdom. Number three, Prayer is about more than God granting our requests. I love this psalm, Psalm 73, 25. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. It's hard to make this third point brief because this is really what we're talking about in an entire quarter in our deeper prayer class. But real deep prayer in the Bible is not about God giving us things. It's not even about uh, God saying yes to our requests. Those things are a side bonus. Those are wonderful things that I think God enjoys doing for his children. But primarily, it's about God giving us himself in relationship, that, that connection, that, that deep relationship with our eternal father, which is what we need the most. It's about walking with him every day in his presence in a way that communicates to him, there is nothing more in this world that I desire than you, God. So when God says no, if our response is well, then what's the point of prayer? Maybe God said no to help us see we have some growing to do about what our understanding of prayer really is all about. Number four, some no's may never make sense to us. You know, I like to think that when we're in heaven, we'll be able to ask God everything. You know, why in the world did you tell me no back then when that just seems so inexplicable and beyond me? But, but I, I can't guarantee that's what heaven will be like. I don't know if that'll happen. I don't even know if it will even matter at that point. But what I do know is that there will be some no's that we will never understand in this lifetime. Sometimes in the Bible, God will be gracious enough to explain to people why he's telling them no, but sometimes God doesn't give an explanation at all. God never did. You realize God never did tell Job why all that stuff happened. Turn with me to Psalm 131. I just think this is fascinating, and you'll see why I'm 
using this in a second. Psalm 131, another prayer by David. And I think this is especially impressive because he's the king. And if anybody should be prideful, and if anybody should think that all of the most important matters must run by his desk first, it would be the king. And yet, listen to his attitude. In verses 1 through 3 here, Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Here's why I'm using this passage. It's so practical because it may be that even if God explained the why to us, we still wouldn't understand it and we may not agree with his reasoning. It's like a child who wants to do something, right? This child has such a limited perspective about the world and how things work. And this child wants to do something and their parents say no. And the child says, well, why not? Now, you know, uh, a lot of parents would just say, well, because I said so, that's just the way it is. But maybe in this case, the parent actually explains why to the child. And you know what? The child still disagrees because the child doesn't, doesn't see things you know, the same way. And the child doesn't think that, that the parents are being fair and that, that that's right. David in this psalm is saying, I'm not going to be like a prideful child who thinks that I can involve myself in, in matters that, that I don't understand, who thinks that my way is best. Instead, I'm going to fully rest in the Lord. I'm going to put all my hope, all my trust in Him, even when things don't make sense to me, because I know I'm safe in His arms. Number five, no tests our trust. It's really easy to trust God when He's saying yes to everything we ask. But when we don't get our way, that is the real test, isn't it? Will we trust His way is best, even when it makes no sense to us, and even if it causes us tremendous pain? What impresses me so much about most of the people in the Bible that God said no to is that they submitted to Him and they obeyed him anyway. When God told Moses no to the promised land, Moses didn't give up on God because of that. He accepted it, and by faith he submitted to God's decision. After God let David's child die, David did not abandon God. On the contrary, in 2 Samuel 12, 20, David arose from the ground washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Job, after losing his entire family, said, well, with the exception of his wife at this point, he said a couple really amazing things. When his wife told him, you should just curse God and die, he says this, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Let's reword this. Shall we indeed accept yeses from God and not accept the noes? Should we only serve God when He gives us yeses, but not when He gives us noes? Then in one of his speeches later in Job 13, 15, he says, Though He slay me, yet I will hope. In him, Job is saying it, it doesn't matter how many times God says no. He can even say no to sparing my life. I'm still going to hope in him. I'm still going to trust in him. Jesus, he's in the garden. He prays that prayer. Please, Father, don't, don't make me go through with this cross. God says no to him. And what does he do? He goes to the cross anyway. He says, your will be done and not mine. Paul the Apostle God said, no, I'm not removing that thorn in the flesh. But Paul continued to go on his missionary journeys. He continued to obey and to submit to the Lord and to continue trusting. And if you, if you really think about it, if you just step back from the bird's eye view of Scripture, this idea of continued faithfulness despite suffering no's from God is really what characterizes the faithful among God's people. So, for instance, here's a good summary. Hebrews 11, talking about people of faith. Others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. 
They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves in holes in the ground. Imagine how many thousands of prayers ascended to God, asking Him not to make us or let us go through with any of this stuff. This is horrible suffering. Yet they still persevered by faith. That's the point of that chapter. They still submitted and trusted. If God says no to us, and we're ready to just give up on Him, or we're ready to, to never pray again, or we're ready to go sin against Him on purpose because we're trying to get back at Him, punish Him for not doing what we want, maybe God told us no to expose our lack of trust, to help us shore up that weakness in us, strengthen our faith, renew our trust in Him. Number six, God's no may provide an unseen benefit. God never told Job why he suffered those things, but Job did benefit from the experience because it helped him gain wisdom that he did not have before. The whole point of the book of Job is that wisdom comes from suffering. And you, you might be able to reword that for this morning's lesson, that Job shows us wisdom comes from suffering painful no's from God. In Jesus' case, Think about it. If the only fragment, you know, you know, we had like one page of the Bible, right? that's all we had. The only fragment of God's word we had was that account of Jesus crying out to his father in the garden and God saying, no, we think God is a monster. I would never serve a God like that. How can he, how can he say no to his own son and allow him to be crucified? What, what a horrible God. I've never prayed to him. But we have much more than a fragment. We, we have the whole Bible. We, we can see the bigger picture that actually the reason God allowed Jesus to go through that was for the benefit of mankind, was to bring salvation to the world. What's hard is when we start getting specific in our own lives and we're asking what possible benefit could come from fares passing. I don't know. It may be one of those things that never will make sense to us in this lifetime. On the other hand, I, I heard a report about some of their neighbors who started going to church with them when they saw the faith of their parents. And so maybe her death was the only way to reach their souls. Maybe this experience is something that will strengthen the faith of her sisters to deal with more hardships that they'll face later in life. Or maybe it's equipping her family to minister to others who have also lost loved ones. I honestly don't know. I don't know what benefit can come from three years worth of headaches all day or whatever chronic pain that you are going through. I don't know what benefit can come from being turned down by a certain job that you spent so many years in college preparing for and it seemed like a perfect fit or, or from being rejected by a certain girl or a guy that you may have wanted to marry. All I know is in Romans 8, verses 28 and 29, it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. Everything God allows to happen to us in this life, every no He gives us can be used for the benefit of making us more like Christ, to produce more faith in us, to produce more patience, more perseverance. God, God is like a, a weaver and he's crafting this beautiful tapestry. But the problem is all we can see are the individual threads. And many of those individual threads are incredibly painful. And yet God is weaving that thread into the bigger picture of his masterpiece. If we'll just trust him with a future that we cannot see. Number seven, God's no may protect us from an unseen danger. Paul had an amazing opportunity to see a vision of heaven, and he's not even sure whether it was in the body or whether it was out of the body, but it was these amazing revelations were given to him that, that were not given to other people. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, because of the surpassing greatness of those revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. As painful as his thorn in the flesh was, whatever it was, it was being used by God to protect him. That God understood there might be some tendency in Paul 
to take pride in the visions that he had, to think that he was superior to other people, and that pride might actually ruin his soul. And so God gives him this thorn to keep him humble, to protect him from that danger. If we think back to the Old Testament, King Jeroboam, one of the worst kings in, in, in Israel's history, and because of his evil, God promised to just bring his whole family down in, in shame, and they would all die shameful, humiliating deaths, and the dogs would lick up their blood, and they wouldn't have a proper burial. It would just be a disgraceful thing. Yet Jeroboam's child got sick, and when he sent to the prophet Ahijah, presumably to get, you know, win the favor of the prophet and try to save this child's life, the child was not spared. And God actually told him why. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. It was actually, by God allowing this child to die, God was honoring this child, giving this child a proper burial and not to be abandoned like the rest of Jeroboam's family as a curse of sin. Not only that, but I wonder if because... Jeroboam's family was so evil that if God would have allowed this child to live, that child would have been corrupted by this wicked family and would have ended up judged as well. So he's protecting this child, his soul really, by taking him early. God knows the future, and we don't. And sometimes when God says no to our request, he's protecting us from a future that would harm us. I read about a guy, he was so angry with God because he... He prayed so fervently for this job, and everything just, it seemed like it was lined up perfectly. It was in the right city. You know, they had a good culture at this job, and it was the right fit for his qualifications, and it was hard to find, you know, other positions. And he was so excited about this job, and then God said no, and he didn't get the job, and it didn't make any sense to him. He was really angry for a long time until that company ended up being involved in a huge scandal and ended up going bankrupt. And then he thought to himself, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe God realized, I don't want you caught up in that. And I'm going to tell you no, because I'm trying to protect you from that. Sometimes it may take years or even decades to see that God was protecting us by saying no. Maybe you were going to marry someone and God said no, and then later that person ended up getting married and their marriage was an absolute disaster because they were a terrible person to marry and you just couldn't see it at the time. Again, with fair there's no way to know. Maybe God was protecting her from some tragedy later in her life that may have been detrimental to her soul in some way. We just don't know, and we may never know, but it's a possibility that her soul was being protected in some way. Number eight, God says no to himself all the time. Growing up, my dad and I, we, uh, we loved getting pizza on Friday nights. But there were some Friday nights where I would ask, ask Dad for pizza, and he would say no, either because it wasn't in the budget or maybe because uh, we had some earlier in the week, and he felt like, okay, maybe a little bit too much pizza, which I thought was impossible. Uh, but when he said no, that was painful for me. I didn't, I didn't really appreciate that. But at the same time, I was comforted on some level to know he was also saying no to himself because he loved pizza too. He loved pizza just like just like I did. And so the same discipline he was asking me to exercise in the no, he was exercising that discipline on himself. And I want to suggest to you, it's the same way with God, except magnified because of God's love and, and his desires to bless his, pe his people. So for instance, in Hosea 11, he talks about Israel in such tender ways. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son, and I led them with cords of a man and with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I, and I bent down and I fed them. God, God absolutely loved the nation of Israel. He, he, he speaks so tenderly to them, and he has so much affection for them. But in this context, in Hosea, God has been brought to a point where he needs to punish them for their sins because they have been so rebellious and wicked and God doesn't want to do it. He says just a few verses later in verse 8, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. God wants to save them from being destroyed by the Assyrians, which, by the way, is why he's sending Hosea to warn them so that they'll change so that, he, so that God won't have to go through with this. 
But unfortunately, it gets to a point where God has to say no to himself and his own desires to save Israel from the Assyrians. And he's got to turn Israel over to their enemies because that is, that is what is best. Now magnify this love and think again about God's perfect son, Jesus, crying out in the garden, please, Father, save me from this cross. When God said no to Jesus, he was saying no to himself, too. No parent wants to watch their child suffer. God absolutely wanted to say, yes, of course I'll save you from that cross. Of course, son, I will not allow you to go through this. Yet God said no to his own desire to rescue Jesus. Likewise, do you think that God wanted to see fair pass away and all the pain that that caused? Do you think God wanted or desired to see that family in so much pain? Of course not. And of course we might ask, well, then why didn't he save her? And that's a great question. But couldn't we also ask that question of every other child in the world that dies? Or every other person that experiences any sort of tragedy or calamity in this world. God wants desperately to keep every calamity and every sort of suffering and death from befalling human beings. But if God allowed himself to get his way and he miraculously intervened every time he wanted to save someone, there would be no suffering or no death at all. Now, of course, that sounds amazing. And by the way, that is the world that God created for us originally, and we messed it all up with our sin, and that's the world that Jesus died on a cross to provide for us in the future. So yes, we are heading that way toward a place with no suffering and death, but for right now, in this time, God allows this world to be a world where we have free will, where he allows natural laws to take their course, where he allows the spiritual forces of wickedness to operate. And he's not intervening miraculously on a daily basis. If he counteracted every natural law that caused someone to die every single time, well, there'd be no need for faith because it would just be so obvious, right? That, that someone's just tinkering with the universe every single day. Um, and this, this is more of a philosophical point, but C.S. Lewis, he, he talked about this, uh, that if God miraculously intervened in everything and overwhelmed us with his presence, it would interfere with our heart's free will to choose to have faith in him. We'd essentially have no choice at all uh, at, at that point. Here's, I like how this writer phrased it. Uh, he said, because the Lord doesn't want to interfere with our free will... He gives enough evidence of his existence so that those who want to believe will have their beliefs justified, but not so much evidence that those who don't want to believe will be forced to feign loyalty. Rather than stopping everything that God doesn't like, God says no to himself. And he chooses instead to use this life as a battleground for the allegiance of our hearts, to make us stronger, to make us more Christ-like, more faithful, more trusting, to see if we will draw near to him even in the times when he says no. And if we think it is hard for us to deal with no's from God and answer for, for our prayers, it's even harder on God because he doesn't want to see any of us in pain. It would give him so much delight to never have to watch his children suffer ever again. So God's saying no to himself too. Number nine, God's grace is sufficient. Paul talking about the thorn in the flesh. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Even though God's no's to our request may be absolutely devastating, and we have no idea how we can possibly carry on, God says, I will give you the strength and the support to carry on, to make it through this trial. His love, His kindness, His saving grace will still be with us even in the deepest, darkest valleys. Think about it this way. He may say no to us in this one area. And that one area where He's saying no is a tremendously painful area. But He also says yes in so many other areas to shower us with blessings, to help us get through. Like good friends, 
close family members, a strong church family, daily sustenance, clothing, a roof over our heads, and all the other spiritual blessings in Christ. It's why Paul could still be perfectly content with God's no, because he knew the more life didn't go his way, the more he'd stop leaning on his own strength, and instead he would lean fully into the strength that only comes from God. And that's why he says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I cannot imagine what the Roberts family has been going through. They have told me there have been days when they didn't think they could stop crying. Yet God's grace has surrounded them with loving support this whole time, including the Fair Garden Memorial that you can read about in the bulletin this morning. And God has been with them the whole time, giving them the strength to keep going. He lets us suffer trials, yes, but then He also gives us the power and the grace to make it through. And ultimately, the greatest grace He gives us is the greatest hope of number 10 that God has prepared for us, the greatest yes in the world. Heaven is the ultimate answer to every request that we have ever made for good things to happen and bad things to stop happening. And I want us to just read as we close this morning in Isaiah 65. This is a poetic description of, of heaven. It's, it's first a poetic description of the peace that we have in, in the church, uh, but, it, but it's ultimately what we have to look forward to. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. <clears throat> God says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. And I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be, get this, an infant in it who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will, thought to be accursed, will be thought to be accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and, and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will wear out the work of their, of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear, or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. And it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they, were, while they are still speaking, I will hear. And the wolf and the lamb will graze together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the dust will be the serpent's food. And they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. When God says no, Satan tries to convince us it's because he doesn't care about us or because prayer is just pointless. But remember that God is so good. He's not only planning to give us an eternal home like this in the end, he said no to himself and to his son in order to make it possible for us to be there. It hurts us deeply when God says no. And I think many times it hurts God to say no to us too. But our request for all the suffering to end, for all the pain to go away, and for only goodness to fill this world will be answered with a huge yes in the end. And when that time comes, all the previous no's will be forgotten and will not even come to mind. Do you have this hope this morning. You can. If you'll come to the Lord believing that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you're willing to repent of your sins and confess Him as your Lord and be baptized this morning, you can have all your sins washed away. And God will say yes if you say to Him this morning, I want to come to you. I want to be saved this morning. God will not say no to that. And if you've done that already, and you've just been discouraged and beaten down. I hope that the sermon has encouraged you. Remember, those other two lessons are online to help you. But if it's gotten you to a point where you just feel like you don't even have a relationship with the Lord anymore, 
come tell us that. Come share that with us. Share it with one of your brethren. Share it with me or Dwayne or the elders. We, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you to strengthen you in whatever way we can so that you can be back on that road to having the ultimate yes answer.